Good evening and welcome to Viewpoint. What happens when the right to freedom of speech clashes with the right to respect for one's private life and reputation? Lawyer Julian Santos speaks to us about privacy and defamation, touching upon his involvement in a high-profile case. That's on the way a little later. First though, Gibraltar is the place billionaire entrepreneur Ruth Parasol has called home over the past 16 years and where she's also based her international headquarters. Viewpoint reports on an event hosted by the party gaming founder at the Rock Hotel to celebrate her time on the Rock. She talked to my colleague Christine Vasquez about her business, philanthropic work and the importance of empowering women. This is um, my international headquarters, the center of my life, my extended family, um, my key business associates, friends, family. Um, I have so many people here and I decided I wanted to throw a party, actually more of an event. I want to do this on a regular basis to update people as to what I'm doing currently and what I'm undertaking with my business, my philanthropy, my family. And so I wanted to kick this off this year and bring a couple of young, talented people to Gibraltar as well to kind of share their talents with the community here. Ruth Parasol founded Party Gaming in 1997, the parent company of online poker site PartyPoker.com, which went public on the London Stock Exchange in June 2005 for £4.6 billion. It was Gibraltar's first ever stock market launch, also known as a flotation or an initial public offering, an IPO. 2004, you chose Gibraltar. Why? Well, I was actually on my way to the Isle of Man. We, the, uh, my company, my gaming company was in the Caribbean and we were looking for a home into Europe. I was headed to the Isle of Man, we had already done a lot of reconnaissance there and I met someone at a gaming show in um, 2002, late in 2002, and he was part of the Victor Chandler group and he started telling me how wonderful um, Gibraltar was and that I didn't want to go to the Isle of Man, that the weather was bad, the, 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 the food wasn't good, it would be very difficult to people, that the Gibraltar gaming uh, framework was much more evolved because companies like Victor Chandler and a number of British bookmakers had already been here for a long time and that it was part of the UK, um, the EU through the UK. And so basically after speaking to him for an hour, I, I said, we're going to Gibraltar. You floated almost immediately. Well, we came here in, um, in early 2004 and we went public in June 2005. A first for Gibraltar as well? It was the first flotation ever for a Gibraltar company. Clever of you to choose the team, especially perhaps if I can um, mention Anurag Dixit, who, who knew his stuff on computers, talking about being the first woman with, with computers. Yeah, okay. actually, um, I was really I was friendly with one of Anurag's classmates from India's Institute of Technology in San Francisco, which is where I grew up. Um, so he introduced me to Anurag and then Anurag um, brought in Vikram Bhargava and other IITians. So I was really fortunate to work with 
you know, some of the, the best minds in technology. And um, I, I lived and worked in, in India, in Hyderabad, India with everyone. And um, I'm still in close contact with, with many of them. I understand that a lot of your projects focus on women in business. Was that hard? Um, well, I, I was fortunate to have a father who really um, uh, fostered me into business. He was a business person. He didn't have any sons. I was his oldest daughter. Um, he was a Holocaust survivor, um, a, a pioneer of early Israel and, and living in a kibbutz. Uh, and so there was not a huge distinction between boys and girls. It was about pioneering um, the new country. So he really, he really raised me as um, as, a, as as a female that could compete with um, or, or thrive among um, men. So um, when I got into business, I was actually one of the first women to ever use the internet. I was telnetting in 1994, um, sending docu documents back and forth on telnet. And uh, probably one of the first users of the internet, Chameleon, and then Netscape went on to AOL. Um, was probably one of the first women to ever own an internet company. Um, was in a, in a male-dominated world. Yeah, 1994, 1995, mm -hmm. and um, definitely probably the first woman to float a my own company on the London Stock Exchange, um, FTSE 100, in 2005. So I think I've been really, really fortunate as a female in business, and I've, I've always worked for myself, so I never had like a corporate glass ceiling above me. Um, I've never really encountered any real type of discrimination in business as a woman because I was a business owner. Um, but a lot of my philanthropic projects focus on, uh, for example, in Israel we have the Parasol Center for uh, women's cancer research, so cancers that are specifically for females. And then we, a lot of my scholarships focus or in fellowships are for women only. That doesn't mean that sometimes we don't give it to a man because there's some amazing projects that he's working on, but, but typically we, we prefer to give our grants to females. Um, and uh, that's just kind of what I feel is important to level the playing field. In my opinion, my mom is still one of the most incredible people I know. These past few days, I've been sitting in through some of my mother's meetings here at her office in Gibraltar. I got to experience firsthand the work that she does in addition to her devotion to her five kids that I constantly witness at home. Thankfully to my mother's devotion, she has always made sure that I had the best education, one of them being traveling and learning about the world. I've been to many different countries and in over five continents, and none of them compare to the family-like community that Gibraltar has. Who would have thought that a tiny little piece of land at the tip of the Iberian Peninsula would have so much life and diversity? It is truly a unique and remarkable place that I love spending time in, from its views of three different countries to its genius culture, and of course, its unforgettable monkeys. It never fails to amaze me. I am so fortunate to have everyone here tonight and that we can all come together for an evening of entertainment. Y obviamente, buena comida. Ruth Parasol was born in Mill Valley, California, where she was raised by her father, Rick Parasol, a Jewish-Polish Holocaust survivor, and Guna Parasol, a Swedish native. I went to law school past the California State Bar, but never imagined working for anyone but myself. I had an eye for young men with techie gadgets in their hands, one of whom showed me how to telnet documents in 1994. 
At that time, I was one of the first early users of the internet and one of the first women to own an internet business. She started her career in her father's successful global business, which included managing real estate, investing in startups, and providing internet and phone services. According to Forbes magazine, she started as an advisor in her father's phone sex chat business, then moved to internet porn websites, and then focused on online gambling. And in fact, Party Gaming was probably the first company founded by a woman to IPO on the FTSE 100, one of the largest listings on the London Stock Exchange at the time, and the first Gibraltar company to ever list on the London Stock Exchange. In 2010, Party Gaming merged with BWIN Interactive, forming BWIN Party Digital Entertainment PLC, then the world's largest publicly traded online gaming company. Ruth Parasol then sold her remaining assets in 2015. She's no longer involved in online gaming, but she's still at heart a businesswoman and has diverse business interests, primarily in long-term investment-grade real estate. She's considered to be one of the world's wealthiest self-made women. I brought party gaming to Gibraltar 16 years ago. Within the first year, we imported dozens of employees, relocated all senior management, hired an additional 200 to 300 people, doubled our revenues, and went from a valuation of 500 million pounds to an IPO market cap of 4.6 billion within 18 months of our move to Gibraltar. After I came here with Party Gaming, many of our competitors followed. All in all, thousands of jobs were created and millions and millions of pounds of wealth was generated for Gibraltar. Party Gaming was an amazing journey, but PLC, PLC life was not for me. So I resigned and proceeded to sell all of my interest in that company over time. Initially, I spent a lot of time at home with my very young children Later, I started to focus on new things like what to do with all the liquid, liquid cash from the IPO and to give to others through my philanthropic endeavors. I established my private family office in Gibraltar in 2004 when I came here, which has since developed into my international headquarters and control center overseeing what is now a multi-generational diversified business. I currently employ more than 20 high-level people in Gibraltar, and we continue to actively hire, plus we keep a number of local law firms and accounting firms busy. <laughs> Initially, I focused on my structure, currency, and basic financial investment products. Then, in 2014, I started to build out my directly owned and operated real estate portfolio, which kick-started with acquisitions in the United States and have since expanded into Europe. The orange indicates markets where we own, and green are in discussions. As of now, we have over 650 million pounds in real estate assets, IRR of over 10%, and employ over 120 people globally. Most of my real estate consists of multifamily and mixed-use properties. <coughs> Soon, we'll be launching a venture capital fund in excess of 100 million focused on emerging technologies. I have three teenagers and two toddlers, all of whom have spent a large portion of their childhood in Gibraltar and proudly carry their Gibraltar-issued British passports. In addition to spending a lot of time in Gibraltar, I spend time in London where my kids are now going to school. We also enjoy Gibraltar, Soto Grande, Tel Aviv, and San Francisco with extended families in this holidays. We heard Ruth Parasol say how her father had spent some time as a young refugee on a ship in Gibraltar's port. <laughs> My parents, who are both European immigrants to America, never imagined I would make home in Gibraltar. This is particularly surreal for my father, whose first experience with Gibraltar was not quite as glamorous as my own. In fact, in 1947, 72 years ago, my father was an 11-year-old orphan from the Holocaust. He spent many weeks docked in Gibraltar on board of one of the three British Navy ships to which 4,500 4, refugees on board the now famous Exodus had been detained and transferred to in order to make their way back to Germany. For those who don't know, Exodus is known as the ship that launched the nation of Israel. 
My first time in Gibraltar was certainly much better, and Gibraltar has been much more enjoyable for my father ever since. Following the establishment of the Trust in 2004, Ruth Parasol has served as the lead International Advisory Board member and as the principal benefactor, having contributed millions of pounds to it. Ruth believes in projects that promote health and research, community and female entrepreneurship. Yes, I have um, been very hardworking and successful, but more than anything, lucky. And part of that luck has been thanks to Gibraltar and its people. My way of giving thanks for my luck is to give opportunities to others through my philanthropic endeavors, which I do through the Parasol Foundation Trust, which was established in Gibraltar also in 2004. I continue to contribute millions to that trust, which is now has over 50 million in its corpus and has already donated 30 million at a run rate of between two and three million pounds per year. And I give much of my time and direction to the projects. The trust contributes to the community and people in education, health, culture, technology, and female empowerment. We support many projects in different countries, including Israel, London, and Gibraltar, and the US. We work with leading organizations such as the, university, such as the Victoria and Albert Museum, Cambridge University, University of San Francisco, the Science Museum, Tel Aviv University. In Tel Aviv Hospital, we have been the lead sponsor of the Parasol Center for Women's Cancer Research and many other projects globally. Here in Gibraltar, we have contributed to GAMPA, University of Gibraltar, Childline, Cancer Relief, and others, with much focus over the years being nature and community, such as the rehabilitation of the Mediterranean steppes, one of my favorites, um, to make them accessible. And we are excited about the participation and opening of the mount to the public. You will notice on the slide behind me five organizations in the black box. Each of these organizations are here tonight, and you may pick up one of their brochures on your way out tonight, and it would be wonderful if you considered your own contribution to one of these wonderful organizations. I love Gibraltar. What else can I say? This is, place will go from strength to strength, and I feel proud to be part of the Gibraltar family. Thank you for being such a great and welcoming community for all these years. To me, my family, my businesses, and my philanthropic efforts are rock. Thank you. We're going to find out more now about Young China, a think tank and advisory designed to build a bridge of understanding between the West and China, with a focus on the pivot generation Millennials. The group's founder, Zach Dykwald, was in Gibraltar delivering an after dinner speech at Ruth Parasol's event on China's development and why international businesses need to better understand Chinese millennials. If you were to write westernization into your Microsoft Word on, on your laptop today, uh, it would capitalize the W. It's an idea we all have in our heads, right? As you modernize, you westernize. If you were to write easternization, into your computer. You'd get the red squiggly lines underneath. Error. It's not an idea that an Eastern power, an Eastern culture, might impact the world on a global level. And it hasn't happened in the last 200, 300 years. What's so interesting about this young generation in China, because of their numbers, because of their political consequence, their economic consequence, we suddenly have to start caring about who they are as people their cultural consequence, and they have enough cultural gravity to maybe start to impact the way our world spins. So what's the combination? Where does it fit together? This answer, this question, excuse me, is going to be answered in the next 10 years. How does China, what do they like about the West? What do they want to keep for themselves? What are they proud of their culture? What do they want to learn from us? And they're looking for partnerships. They're looking for people to do this with. I describe what I do. I describe what I enjoy doing as bridge work, creating understanding from one place to the other. 
Zach, welcome to Viewpoint. First of all, what are the misconceptions that you feel the West have on China? I'm sure you can imagine there's a handful. The biggest misconception comes from our viewpoint on the pace of change in China. I think we uh, look at the relationship we have with our parents, we look at the relationship we have with the generations uh, where we're from, and we expect that China changes in the exact same way. China has changed so fast over such a short period of time that the cultural distance between the generations just within China mean that many of the ideas we have of China that are five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, are already ancient history. You know, I talk a lot about young China. Young China means two things. First, it obviously means young people. Uh, 417 million millennials uh, in China, just to put that into context. There are more young people in China than there are young people in North America, the Middle East, and Europe combined. So a, a massive population. But the other misconception or the other definition of young China uh, refers to this new image of China, this new identity of China. Uh, that's a departure from the old version that most of us associate. So uh, we need to stop thinking of China as closed off from the rest of the world. They used to be, they're not today. We need to stop thinking of China as weak. I know that many of us actually don't think of China as weak, mm -hmm. but many people within China still consider themselves, uh, especially the older generations, reflect on themselves as not being the strong nation that we, we have sort of given them credit for. And then on top of that, we need to recognize that there might be some legitimacy in the lived experience of these young people and being proud of who they are and being proud of, China, of, of being Chinese. And, and this gets a little bit touchy, being proud of their government. How, how does the pivot generation differ? You, you say um, they're totally different. How do they differ from past generations? This younger generation has grown up exposed to the outside world. Uh, and different than the older generation, which was a subsistence generation. Remember that China used to be bitterly poor. In 1990, when, when I was born, uh, when my friends in China were born, the per capita GDP was just around $300 US. So they're not thinking about consumption, they're not thinking about travel, and they're not thinking about influencing the macro uh, political situation, which is what we think of for China today. They were thinking about survival. That was the old China. They were known as the chikhu de yidai, the eat bitter generation. Eat bitter means the ability to do difficult things for long periods of time at the prospect of delayed gratification. This young generation has not grown up with that subsistence mentality. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the psychology um, concept that says when you're concerned with the basics, food, water, shelter, that's all you're concerned with. Once you can surpass that, you move up the hierarchy of needs, you can start and, and can start considering identity questions. Who am I? What do I stand for? What are my values? How do I want to be loved? What do I want from uh, my friends, my family, my government? How do I see sex? How do I see power? Uh, these identity questions are what this young generation has the luxury of thinking about now, which old China, which the past in China, their parents, their grandparents, can never even consider. When things move too fast, though, you, you can get a disenfranchised society because they don't quite, it doesn't quite sit comfortably. It's just too fast. Do you find that? There is no doubt that China, as a culture, has had to push faster and farther in a short period of time than any other, particularly this generation, than any other generation on Earth. And that's no exaggeration. We compare China to India, we compare China to um, other developing countries. Those are sort of false comparisons. When you think about the amount that China has changed in the, in the time span that it has, it really stands apart uh, on the entire globe today. Now, does that lead to discomfort? Does that lead to incongruities? Does that lead to some slippages? Without a doubt. I refer to this generation as the restless generation. The reason is, is because anyone who's gone through the process of finding your identity knows that it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. It's really not that easy. And particularly in China, which has such a strong sense of culture, a strong sense of self, you have what, what I think of as two tectonic plates rubbing against one another. On one hand, you have tradition, old China, what it's always meant to be Chinese, the importance of family, education, um, being able to start your own sort of, stand on your own two feet. Uh, and on the other side, you have the pressures of modernity rapid urbanization, a massive increase in, um, in the need to be edu educated. Uh, those two pressures are grinding against one another. 
this young generation is at the fault line trying to figure out, okay, how do those two tectonic plates, old and new, how do they fit together? What does it mean to be Chinese in the modern world? This young generation is responsible for, for answering that question. You gave an example that you said that they were proud of their, their government. So how does a generation of millennials grow and thrive under politics of censorship? When we think about the Chinese government from outside of China, we think of sort of Big Brother, right? We think of that uh, ominous dictator who is watching you do exercises in the morning and, and monitoring everything that you do. Um, in China, the attitude's a little different. Obviously, right now, with, with what's happening in terms of the virus, things are a little bit different. But typically, the, the idiom that I use to describe the way that most young people see their relationship with the government is, is Tian Gao Huang Di Yuan. It means uh, heaven is high and the emperor is far away. There's not this feeling when you're within China that the government is involved in every single thing that you do. No feeling of oppression. There's, there's a feeling of constraint. So there's a, there's a big difference between oppression and constraint. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to knock up against the wall of censorship. It's really not. Um, the, the issue between, the distance between oppression and restraint, though, is one that has to do with the want for overthrow and one that has to do with the general discomfort. We are on this side of the spectrum. In China. Are people comfortable with constraint? It's like children when you give them barriers and they actually feel comfortable. It's all they've known. People recognize that there's a trade-off. So to your point, it is all that most people have known in China. Only 9% of the population has a passport. Uh, so it's not like there's a huge amount of the population that's traveling abroad. With that being said, this young generation in particular has grown up watching our TV, listening to our music, uh, wearing our fashion. I have friends who can quote Barney from How I Met Your Mother and Martin Luther King Jr. in the same sentence. There's a fluency in the outside world. There's an understanding of what they're missing. With that being said, uh, they've also, they understand the good and bad about much of our culture. And they recognize that while, sure, there are some trade-offs to, to operating within their system, uh, there seems to be trade-offs with operating within our system as well, and at least theirs gets stuff done. There's um, a lot of philanthropic um, things that you do. It started off as Bonita, and now it's the Parasol Foundation. Yeah, I mean, I see myself very much as, a, as a, a, a daughter, a sister, a mother, a business person, and then a philanthropist. So I've been really lucky. Life's been really good to me, and I, I want to be able to share um, my wealth and, and help create opportunity um, for others and, and foster community. So what happens next? What happens next for Ruth Parasol and Gibraltar? You, you obviously like where you are here to stay. I'm here to stay. This is my international headquarters, as I said. This is my control center of my global operations. We're active in a number of businesses um, in many places. Um, what I've been principally focused on since 2014 is my real estate fund. It's my own fund. We're not soliciting third-party money, although we might, in, we might at some point launch a fund for other family offices to participate in. But um, primarily we do uh, real estate, multifamily, and mixed use. We're active throughout the United States, London, we're looking at Poland and Greece, um, have, a, have a couple of properties in um, London, as I said, Israel, Spain, um, and just really expanding my real estate portfolio, which employs over 120 people worldwide. But the 20 here is, is the control. Um, center for everything. This is very much my home. We spend a lot of time in Gibraltar. Um, my children are Gibraltarian, um, consider themselves Gibraltarian, and um, you know this is this is where I intend to spend you know a large part of my uh, life and my business opportunities and my philanthropy.